in a parking lot at a government lab near Washington are the remains of the World Trade Center. 200 tons of steel salvaged from ground zero. Just a tiny part of the original million ton structure, but maybe enough to solve a mystery. Obviously it was damaged by the impact of the uh, airplanes, but it stayed up for quite some time afterward and actually collapsed due to the fire. So we want to investigate precisely what happened, materials, design, what was the total interplay so that we can have impacts on the building codes and designs of buildings in the future to see if there's anything that should be avoided. Tim Fakey is a metallurgist at a U.S. government lab called the National Institute of Standards and Technology. NIST is investigating the collapse. And to find out why the towers came down, the researchers are putting them together again in computer simulations. Engineers call them models. We mathematically, in a computer, construct each piece, all of the connections, as close to reality as we can. And then we can take something else like an airplane or a fire to affect that structure in the computer and see if we can recreate what actually happened that day. To build a realistic model, they have to analyze the actual steel of the Twin Towers. That's because the World Trade Center was primarily a steel structure. Okay, what we have here is a diagram of the damage to the side of World Trade Center 1 from the first airplane, where you can see where the wings went in, where the two engines were on the fuselage, and mapped around this are the uh, pieces that we've identified that we've recovered and physically are here on site that we're studying. And the most interesting of all these pieces metallurgically is this one here because it was directly impacted by the airplane at 500 miles an hour. And this particular piece we happen to have standing up right here, we call it M27. It spanned the 93rd to the 96th floors of World Trade Center 1 and the plane actually impacted on the very topmost portion. Now, when we look at this from a failure point of view, if we look at the fracture surfaces up there and look at the surface features, we can tell how the steel behaved being hit by an airplane at 500 miles an hour. That information, coupled with the tests we're doing, feeds information into the models. Tim's task is complicated because of the condition of the steel, twisted by the fall and heated by the smoldering fire at ground zero. To find out what damage was caused by the plane, and only by the plane, he turns to image analysis enhancing videos and photos taken on September the 11th. And from this information, we can map out, say, a specific column that we know that we have. For example, M27 actually belongs right here. And by taking a closer look at that, you can map out, here's where M27 should be. By comparing this image to what we have out in the parking lot or out in the other building, we can determine that these two failures, the top of this column, and this one here were caused by the airplane's impact and the fact that this column is currently missing out there was due to the building's collapse. Another factor that complicates learning about the metal is the fact that the World Trade Center was built with 14 different types of steel with very different properties. To find out how all the various kinds of steel behaved when the jets crashed into the towers... Three, two, one, zero. <laughs> NIST researchers are smashing tiny samples of the steel in a device called a Kolsky bar. An air gun fires a projectile at a metal bar, and pressure waves travel down the bar and crush a piece of steel that's only slightly thicker than a dime. Sensors record the amount of stress that each piece is subjected to, while a high-speed video camera records the damage. It all happens in one seven thousandth of a second. Meanwhile, at NIST's Building and Fire Research Lab, researchers are gathering data on what happens when a typical World Trade Center workstation is doused with jet fuel and satellite. The workstation is accurate right down to the paper, furniture, computer, and wall coverings. That's information Kevin McGratton can use. He's modeling the spread of the fire in the towers. He has rebuilt individual floors using floor plans supplied by former tenants. Here we are on one particular floor, and you can see the outlines of the furnishings, and I'm superimposing the numerical grid. You could think of this numerical grid as the Lego blocks that make up the tower. Nothing in the tower 
can be shown in finer detail than a single Lego block, which might be this big for these types of calculations. And in each of these blocks, we assert the laws of physics, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. And each of these blocks communicates with the one next to it. And in the end, you put it all together, and that gives you a map, essentially, of how those hot gases are moving and what the, what the temperature of those hot gases are. We take that information, we provide it to the structural engineers, and they ask themselves, OK, how will the strength of the steel be affected by those high temperatures? And eventually, they will try to pinpoint exactly what failed. What you're seeing on the computer screen here is very sanitized. But we take our calculations and we compare them with these photographs that we're seeing, and then it hits home that of what really happened. Understanding what happened will not ease the enduring tragedy, but if NIST can suggest any changes to high-rise building codes, it could save lives in the future.